You are listening to the Toxic Mold Podcast with Steve Worsley, the toxic mold expert and your number one source for mold consulting and mitigation in the USA. Let's dive into a brand new episode. Before we get started on this episode, here's a not so short disclaimer. While all attempts have been made to verify the content provided in this podcast, neither the podcaster or the producers assume any responsibility for errors, omissions, or alternative interpretations of the issues discussed here. All information stated in this podcast is the opinion of Steve Worsley. Steve Worsley is a mold specialist with over 25 years of experience in the construction and mold industry. The Toxic Mold Podcast is for information sharing purposes only. The views expressed are those of the podcaster and his alone. These views should not be taken as expert instruction or commands. While there may be references to medical conditions and symptoms, all podcast episodes are the opinion of Steve Worsley and any medical questions or concerns shall be addressed with the appropriate licensed medical professional or professionals. As the podcaster refers to different mold types, please be aware that Steve Worsley is not a microbiologist and questions concerning mold specifics should be answered by the appropriate professional. Steve isn't nor does he offer any legal advice. For any legal advice, you must speak with a lawyer. The listener is 100% responsible for his or her own actions. You can check out Steve's books on Amazon. Just go to Amazon and search for author Steve Worsley. You can also take Steve's courses on Udemy or Skillshare, and you can find out more about those at cnccontractorservices.com. Now, let's get to the episode. Hello, you're listening to the Toxic Mold Podcast with myself, Steve Worsley. And once again, we have my wife, Cassandra, here. Yes, for another episode. Yes, it's uh, today's April Fool's Day. Yeah, it doesn't feel like April, though. Yeah, we're not going to come up with any stupid jokes or anything like that. But I will just say that that toxic mold exposure is no April Fool's joke. No, it is not. So today is episode 253, and it is our 2024 spring checklist. I can't remember. I think in the past we've tried to do the spring checklist when we do the clock change, but... I don't know. I think we say this every time with the the, uh, daylight savings, but it seems like it gets earlier and earlier every year. And at some point, like, when are we going to stop doing that? Well, but so much of it, too, is weather dependent. The things you're about to talk about involves going on a roof. And, you know, so if you live in New Hampshire, you live in Wyoming, where there's still snow, probably even up to May, June, July, (laughs) trying to determine when you, even though it's officially spring, Complete the spring checklist is sometimes a mystery. And when when does officially spring start? March 21st. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so, you know. We're a couple weeks behind that. Exactly. So at the end of the day, it is spring, but it may not really be spring where you are. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, you know, we do this every year. We do a spring and fall checklist. We've created documents and, you know, in the emails that I send out, I do a more detailed um, checklist, but... It's something that's important. It's for the most part when we talk about this, it's it's not really focused on mold. Does that make sense? But it could definitely impact mold. Exactly. Growth. Yeah, if 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 you don't do these things, you can definitely have mold concerns. You can also have structural concerns with your home. So, it's just something I think's important that we always do and we kind of quickly just go through it. And it's a really good thing to do, especially because, you know, April, May, some places, June, kids come home for the summer from school, meaning they're there all the time at home. Yep. So you want to do the spring checklist before all the kids get out for the summer break. Exactly. Because they will be cooped up in the house or outside, but they'll still spend more time in the home than they do with exactly. school. Yeah. We, you know, we kind of, you get that cabin fever all winter. And then now for the last month, we've had some nicer weather to be able to get outside. But then on the other hand, like you said, it's probably raining a lot for what you say in Wyoming it never stops snowing (laughs) exactly so at the end of the day it's important to figure out when you're going to do the spring checklist to get it done exactly and it's something you know for our listeners it doesn't take you know half a day to do this if you do the the major things you could literally do this spring checklist in an hour 
Now, that's awesome. That's not what I'd recommend, but, you know, pick a day that it's rainy. Well, don't get on your roof when it's rainy, but as far as the inside stuff, do it when it's a rainy day and you're doing spring cleaning anyways. That's true. And give your, even though it could take as minimal as an hour, give yourself two to four hours. Exactly. You know, I go through the checklist the same way I do an inspection. Our listeners know, you know, when we do a mold inspection or back when I did home inspections, I always start with the exterior. The reason I did that is because if I see defects, let's say on a roof, that tells me, okay, in this section of the roof, when I'm up in the attic, I'm going to pay special attention to that area. If there's a grading issue or a foundation crack that's of concern to me, I'll know when I'm inside to to investigate that area more. So I always recommend starting on the exterior. I get it. People don't like to crawl up on roofs. Don't do it if you're not comfortable with it. But it is important to walk a roof. Yes, binoculars, drones, whatever are obviously more convenient, but you're going to find more defects if you walk the roof. And, you know... If, like I said, if you're not comfortable, don't do it. Use binoculars. But for the roof, the main thing we want to be looking for is missing shingles, any debris up on the roof. You know, if you have trees around your home, make sure your rain gutters have screens on them. Make sure there's no standing water in the rain gutters. Standing water in there, unless it just rained. Well, anytime standing water is not good. But that would tell us that your gutters aren't draining properly. Okay. And when we talk about the rain gutters, make sure. If you need screens, make sure all the screens are intact. Make sure the downspouts, which are the things that come down the house, make sure those have extensions, which should be like six feet. Those are a pain in the butt sometimes because you have to flip them up to mow. But make sure they're all functional. And that they're pushing water away from the house. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And also, you know, while you're doing that, you can walk around the perimeter of your home, check the foundation for any cracks per current certification standards and home inspection standards. Cracks up to one eighth of an inch, which is literally the end of a pencil, those are classified as common curing and settling cracks. So your foundation is going to have cracks. Do not freak out because you see cracks. That's what happens. The earth spin. So we're moving. It's going to crack a little bit. Um, But more importantly, make sure the grading and drainage drains away from the home for a minimum of six feet. Okay. And, you know, when we're talking about like foundation cracks, check all the hard surfaces. So the hard surfaces would be sidewalks, foundation, brick, grout, things like that. Stucco, if you have stucco, make sure there's no abnormal, which would be larger than one-eighth of an inch in width cracking. Okay. Take pictures, you know, keep keep a little journal. We have, uh, we just talked about it last week. We have a digital package that we're working on that's going to have checklists in it. But write this stuff down. Make sure you're keeping track of it because it's going to crack. Things are going to crack. We just want to see if it, if it's getting larger over time. And if those cracks do get larger over time, that's because of improper grading and drainage. Got it. So then... You know, check all like the outlets, make sure your outlets have weatherproof covers on them. Check the around the windows and the doors, make sure that they're silicone, especially on top, so that water can't get between that door and the, the framing or siding or anything like that. Did I cover everything outside? I think you did. Did you cover electrical components? Yeah, well, as far as I I mentioned outlets, make sure they have weatherproof covers, but make sure all of your lights, everything are attached properly. Something like your main power disconnect that comes into, well, it doesn't come into the home, but it's attached usually where your meter is on the wall. Look at that. Make sure that it's not pulling away from the wall. There should be a conduit that runs from the box itself down to the ground. Make sure that it's not settling. Make sure it's not pulling away from the box, things like that. Okay. So, yeah, I think you covered everything exterior. So then after the exterior, what I recommend is the crawl space and the attic. What order you do those ends up to you. Um, but it is important. Every home has an, well, I shouldn't say that. Most homes have attics. If you have vaulted ceilings, then you might not have an attic access. But most homes have an attic access. I don't recommend that our listeners go up into the attic and walk around. 
That's dangerous, especially since most homes have blown-in insulation. You can't see the roof trusses, and if you miss that roof you truss, fall through. Yeah, you'll you'll step through the ceiling. Yeah, and you'll have a heck of a mess on your hands. But up in the attic, just you can inspect it from the access itself. You want to check all the wood framing components, so the trusses, the subroof that you can see, you know, you'll be looking up at it. Check all of that for any suspected mold or water stains. Another important thing is, and we talk about this all the time, you should have a humidity gauge up in the attic. And hopefully you have one that's Bluetooth to a unit or your phone. But it's important to monitor the humidity in your attic. So if you have mice in your attic and you don't know about it, will the mice being present cause the humidity to go up? Shouldn't. Okay. Um, now, we have seen, we talked about that federal job we did last year. When we, when we removed, we had to remove all the flooring, even the subfloor. Remember I told you that there were some cavities? It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. It was packed in there so tight from the mice like they, I don't know what it was. Like it, some of it looked like seeds. Some mm-hmm. of it was insulation, but it was packed in there so tight and full of urine that when we removed it, the wet, the wood was so wet. We had to wait a couple of weeks before we could treat it and, wow. and waterproof it. So <laughs> to answer your question, the mice shouldn't cause mold directly. Now mice are going to do things like eat insulation or move it. They're going to have nests. They're going to create holes in things. Those holes could contribute to moisture intrusion because it's a void. Does that make sense? That does make sense. So you kind of answered my question in the sense of if you have a humidity gauge in an attic and or in a crawl space, it will gauge humidity, but you still physically need to go up there on a regular basis to make sure you're not dealing with other issues like this. Yep. And you know, if there's mice, you, you'll you be able to tell, you know, like I said, they'll move the insulation around. You'll see mice droppings, you know, it's just something and you'll smell it. You'll smell their urine up there, but make sure, you know, that the, you don't have any pests, you know, let's mice, spiders, termites, anything like that. Termites leave a trail that's you would have to probably Google it for our listeners, but it's literally like these little tubes that they leave Mm -hmm. and you can just tell it almost looks like it's sand, but that's termite damage. So make sure you check for things like that. When you're down in a crawl space, make sure you're looking for standing water. It's spring, so it's going to be wetter down there. Mm -hmm. Once again, make sure you have a humidity gauge down there. Lots of mold remediation projects that we deal with is because of wet crawl spaces. So definitely even uh, even if somebody's saying, well, I barely go my crawl space, why should I look at that? You're saying you should because yeah. there could be issues that lead to mold yeah. in the crawl space. Exactly. Okay. And, you know, a lot of times we hear people say, well, you know, it's a conditioned crawl space or it's totally separate as far as the air quality down there compared to the living area above it. That's not always true. It's very common due to the stack effect. And we've talked about that in previous podcast, but homes are somewhat pressurized and depending on the barometric pressure, air conditioners, windows open, doors open, you could be easily sucking that air from the crawl space right up into the living area. Okay. And and that would happen, you know, like where pipes come through the floor or things like that. Mice. One thing about mice that I used to tell all my clients when I did inspections all the time, a mouse has a collapsible rib cage. Yeah. Mm. And so they literally can squeeze through and fit through something like the size of that pencil. Which is really scary if you don't like mice. Yeah. And I don't know anybody Um, that likes mice, do you? No. I just, I think, and keep in mind, if they can, with their collapsible ribs, fit through something that's the size of a pencil or the, what would you call that, the diameter? Yes. The diameter of a pencil. That means they can get into new and old houses alike. Yes. Yeah. It's common. I mean, especially, you know, if you live in a new subdivision where a year or two prior it was just a field, Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a lot of mice. And, you know, that's where I'm not a fan of snakes at all. But non-poisonous snakes, that's where they're they're good because they keep the mice down. Huh. But but it's, you know, another thing to check in your crawl space, make sure you have a vapor barrier so you have that plastic down over the dirt. But do the same thing in your crawl space. Look at all your floor joists, all your framing. 
check for water stains. Going back to a vapor barrier, we've talked about this before, but I always recommend having a black vapor barrier. And the reason I always recommend black plastic sheeting is if there's a water leak, once it dries, it leaves that calcium stain and it's easier to spot on black plastic. On black versus white. Yep. Is black cheaper than white? No. Oh, it's not. It's more expensive. No. No, I, I don't know if it's more expensive, but for the most part, there's no price difference. Um, and would you say that putting down a vapor barrier is something that somebody could DIY, watch a YouTube channel and do it? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And I, I mean, you know, when we do it as professionals, you know, we don't do it. I wouldn't say like we don't do vapor barriers just for clients that need a vapor barrier. It's in conjunction with mold remediation. But when we put them down, we use mushroom head stakes. You've seen those. Mm -hmm. So they have a big, big diameter head on them. Uh, we tape, we use seam tape. We tape all the seams. We run it up the foundation. Sometimes we run it all the way up to um, the floor joist, which you could argue either way if that's a smart thing to do. But having a vapor barrier will substantially lower the humidity levels in a crawl space. Okay. So we've gone through exterior, crawl space, attic. So then we jump to the inside. The most problematic areas are going to be where there are plumbing fixtures. So a mechanical room, pay special attention to that. If you have sump pumps, Test your sump pump. If you have to, take a bucket of water and pour it in your sump pit. Make the float or the pump activate. Check the discharge pipe, which they should have anti-siphon valves. Make sure that if you have a sump pump, it's being discharged outside in an area where the water can't come right back into the home. Okay. And the reason I say that is a lot of times we see that a sump pump's in, let's say, a crawl space or basement, then it's piped to the exterior and it literally just dumps the water right outside the foundation well you're literally just recycling that water exactly. constantly so it's very important to make sure that discharge pipe is terminating somewhere where the water gets away from the home, from the home. Um, so pay special attention like i said to mechanical rooms in the spring typically you're going to be finishing up using your furnace in the falls when i really recommend bringing in a hvac technician but make sure like i said you're you're checking your water heater for any leaks. Check all your piping. Make sure that there's no leaks. Once you're done with the, what I call the problematic areas, I would check all the walls and ceilings for cracks, any water stains. Um, check underneath your sinks for leaking faucets. Make sure you turn on the faucets. Check around your windows. One place that we usually see issues is, is check around the furniture that's right up against the exterior walls. Okay. Because a lot of times, you know, if you have, you know, in a bedroom, say it's the dresser or in a living room, the entertainment center, a lot of times when those pieces of furniture against the wall in the winter months, condensation happens and then you move that away and it's a bunch of mold. Oh, okay. Okay. So check your teenager's room for food that was from last year. Oh, that's true. Or stinky clothes that might be moist. Yep. yep. Or, you know, a lot of times people in bathrooms just throw their towels in one corner. Oh, that's true. Um, check for things like that. You know, you don't have to do like what a home inspector would do and test outlets and all that kind of stuff. But, but just, we're, you know, we're focused more on water stains and things that can lead to mold. Exactly. So, and you also have checked for uneven floors and what, why are uneven floors a thing? Well, if a floor's buckling, it could be from two different things. It can either be a structural issue, which is typically caused by water, or it could be from water. So if the floors are uneven, maybe water's getting underneath that floor. Could be in a bathroom. Maybe the kids are splashing in a tub. Could be where your pet bowl is, their water bowl, things like that. What if the floor was just built the wrong way, like the floor right outside our office here? You know, yeah. like we, slant, we stand on a diagonal. Yeah. Do you have concerns when you're doing, if you know you structurally, you built a new house, you have a new house build, and the floors are uneven because who built the house built them that way? Do you have to inspect that or you just know that's what it is? Well, so just to explain to our listeners, we have a full basement. And when they poured the floor, the to where my office is, which is where we record these, they just didn't do it level at all. It's not even the mechanical no, it's like room. A it, it, it dives off quite a bit, but you could just tell that that's how they poured the floor. Okay. Um, 
it's a concrete floor below that. So once again, it is a basement. So you do want to make sure, like we know that's concrete and it's always been that way. Mm -hmm. But that's why it's important to just document it. Like if the house was to be sold and they had a home inspector come in, you know, we could say, hey, it's always been that way. Yeah. As a home inspector, do I just believe what I'm told? No, but I could look at the walls and see there's no cracking. Like I could see other things that would lead me to believe if it was a chronic issue. Does okay. that make sense? Okay, that makes sense. So you document so that you say it's always been this way and you inspect it just to make sure it's not causing any problems this year, next yeah. year, whenever. Yep. Okay. If it was a, a chronic issue, you would see cracking you know, in the, you, the floor would start to separate in the walls. You would see cracks in the walls. Like once again, cracks in sheetrock are not abnormal as long as they're within an one eighth of an inch in width. Okay. I don't quite believe that seems a little wider than it should be, but, but you got to remember that, that a lot of building materials, including wood, there's moisture in it and, and it's going to shrink and expand. Like for our listeners, they'll know like, Maybe their child's bedroom door all summer, it never closes for whatever reason. It could be that the, the wood shrunk and it just, the striker plates off, mm -hmm. but they know that. Exactly. You know, they know there's always that crack up there that never goes away. And, you know, a lot of people, I hear them say, yeah, we fix it all the time, but it keeps coming back. Well, it's because your house is moving. And typically when you fix a crack with plaster or joint compound, it doesn't have the elasticity to, to move. Does that make sense? That does make sense. So it's not a big deal, but you do, like going back to your question, you do just want to make sure you document things and, you know, take a picture of it and say, yeah, it's been this way for 20 years. Exactly. So we've covered exterior for the spring checklist, crawl space and attic, interior. Next, what are we talking about on the spring checklist? We kind of covered a little bit of it with mechanical, but okay. make sure you, you know, if you cover your AC condensing unit outside, if you cover that all winter, make sure you take the cover off. There's things you're going to do, like with your sprinklers. You can open water valves for your outside spigots. Um, there's little things like that that, you know, our listeners would know. I mean, a home is like your body. You have to maintain it. Absolutely, which which leads us into IAQ. Yep, and and that's where we get into obviously what my expertise is, but when it comes to the indoor air quality, like if you have your Luft monitor, make sure you're checking the quarterly readings on it, which get emailed to you. Check and make sure there's no radon issues, VOCs, things like that. As far as safety, you do want to test your smoke detectors, change out the batteries in those. You should have CO, carbon monoxide detectors. Make sure you check those. And Everybody should have an operational fire extinguisher, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. It's, you know, depending on the layout of the house, it's always a good idea to have one, whether it's in your pantry, maybe the garage is right next to the the uh, kitchen. You should have a fire extinguisher. That's close to the kitchen. And what about fire escape plans? I mean, some people have small children. Some people have teenagers that don't know the fire escape plan. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's something we've talked about before, always review that you know i remember when i was in elementary school you know we i don't even recall what it was if it was the fire master or mcgruff the dog i think that was for crime wasn't it yeah crime but anyhow we would always review like you know depending on your house or where your bedroom is what would you do in a fire and that's why it's important to go over that which brings up something make sure any buddy that sleeps in your home, they are in a room that has a escape route, meaning it should always have a window or a door. And I thought you were going to say, make sure that when people go to sleep in their rooms, the door is closed. Yes. And you showed me that to. one video where it's terrible if the doors yeah. aren't closed. Yeah. If, if, if the, if the doors aren't closed and there's a fire, the fire will just spread very quickly. Oh, wow. And wow. as crazy as that sounds, that's it's for safety reasons. And I get it. Kids don't like their doors closed. But I think if you raise your children, like being used to that and you explain to them why, then they get it. Exactly. So just make sure you go over that stuff, especially if you have little ones. Yeah. So they know what the plan exactly. is. Exactly. And even a teenager, like everybody in the home should know, like if you see smoke coming underneath your door, you probably don't want to go out in that hallway. You, you're going to have to escape through a window. Yeah. 
And a broken leg jumping from second story is much better than dying of smoke inhalation or burning to death. That's that's very, very true. So, I mean, it yeah. sounds crazy. Alive, but Alive, not dead, right? Exactly. So yeah. it is something you should go over with all the occupants, even your 15-year-old that thinks they know it all. Oh, absolutely. Especially the 15-year-old that thinks they know it all. <laughs> so what's your call to action for people? Just like I said, take an hour and just make sure you do this inspection or checklist just to make sure you don't have issues. If you do, or you're not sure, or you do the checklist and you find all these problems, we offer consultations. If you're doing this checklist and you're finding tons of problems, you're like, hey, I I think I might want a set of professional eyes on it. We do offer VPAs, which are virtual property assessments. It's nothing's as good as me being there on site, but we can do it uh, via Zoom, and it's pretty thorough. I've I've done plenty of them, and some of them go really well. Some of them we find mold. So, you know, it's just something we can do, and I can walk you through, like, hey, that crack, maybe it's because of flat grading. There's a lot of things we can do virtually. So there. don't be scared to, you know, either reach out if you don't know what package to use, but go to our site. I'll put a link in the uh, comment section or the description, whatever it is. I'll put a, a link for our consulting packages, but don't hesitate to reach out. Absolutely. Every minute you spend not reaching out could be a minute that you're exposed to something you don't exactly. want to be exposed to. Yep. All right. Well, this was episode 253. We appreciate all of you and have a wonderful week. Thank you for listening to this episode. Make sure you go to our website at cnccontractorservices.com and sign up for the Mold Investigation Checklist. Again, go to cnccontractorservices.com and get your free Mold Investigation Checklist today. You can also, on cnccontractorservices.com, find out more about Steve's courses and books and consultations. Once again, go to cnccontractorservices.com.